Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the workshop. Fantastic to have you here because we are working on a damask steel chef's knife and I want this thing to be a really nice piece of work. So it's fantastic to bring you along and it's also fantastic, speaking of sharp things, to have Dollar Shave Club sponsoring today's episode with their daily essentials kit that you can get at dollarshaveclub.com forward slash forge one wipe charlies. Amber lavender body cleanser. Get yourself some shave butter for that uh, steel smooth finish and a razor with enough blades for a month. They are sponsoring the video and you can get that kit for just five bucks to keep yourself looking prim and proper for the month. Thank you Dollar Shave Club for sponsoring the video. Let's get right to it because we have some milling to do after having made up our Damascus yesterday. I'm gonna set this up with a little uh, ball bearing that has a flat spot ground on it up against some copper. And no, that doesn't look good. It's heavily rhombused, so it's difficult getting it set up securely in the mill in a way that gives us a good base to work off of. We really want to make sure it's secure. I'm going to go on with the mill. I'm going to cut across until we're at clean material and hopefully below any weld deposits. is off the mill. We have ourselves a nice square block. Now, the main thing wasn't getting it square. The main thing and the most important thing was getting through all the TIG welds. Even though a lot of them were fusion TIG welds, that does affect the pattern. A pattern relies solely on there being a differentiation and a boundary between one alloy and the other. As soon as we then make a puddle, there's no differentiation. It is uh, just this conglomeration, this alloyed bit instead of two separate alloys. So we've got to get through all the world, and that's the key thing because now we are etching it. Oh my goodness, that pattern's amazing. <gasps> ah! Whoa! God! Fucking cool! Whoa! Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Ha! That feels good. So obviously we're now etching it so that we can have a look at it, observe it, and see if there are any faces where we need to remove more material. Before we do that though, just have a look at that stunning, stunning pattern. And again, I take no credit for the pattern. I am simply following Mareko's instructions. Let's see if we spot any weld. All right. Upon further examination, the front faces are looking good and beautiful. It is extremely difficult to show you what I'm looking at but on the sides, I can still see a weld bead. So we're gonna mill the sides some more. Right, let's give it a second look. Oh yeah, we're looking good. This is ready to forge a knife out of. I've decided I want the tip of the blade to this side, and so what I've done is I've ground myself a little chamfer here so I know where it is that I forge the isolation for the bolster of the knife. The forge is warming up. And it is time to flash back to yesterday, where now I have been, I've mentioned Mareko a lot of Maomassi Fire Arts, and the reason for it is because he is the chef knife guy. He is the name that you think of when you think of the finest chef's knives there are. And Mareko was kind enough to hop on a call with me and give me some tips. Hey Mareko, what's up? How you doing? Can you see me? I can see you. Outstanding. How many cubic inches of material am I going to need for the knife itself to forge that out? I'm usually starting with about three to three and a half cubic inches. Typically, the, the block is about three quarters of an inch thick by about an inch and a quarter to an inch and a half wide by about three inches to three and a half inches long. Or maybe three and a quarter, I don't know, somewhere in there. And that comes out to being about three to three and a half cubic inches. So that's all very helpful because now I know that the amount of material I go around right here is actually going to be pretty damn good. It looks to be in the three, three and a half cubic inch range. And so we're now ready to forge this blade. And so here is going to be operation number one. Take this on that corner with the chamfer, isolate it, and forge down a little square lug with enough material for the bolster and the tang. 
from here. We're then going to put a point on it, and I'm going to face that point down to the edge side, because as we forge that bevel, that's going to come back up. We're then going to isolate the blade from the bolster using flat dies, but that, you know what, that's actually too much in one go. I don't even think I'm going to remember that. So we're going to put it in the fire, and we're going to get to that stage, and then we'll do a little more thunking. Preform. I think it's looking how it needs to look. You can see it's looking a lot like this step here. And if we follow our progression on, you will see that from here, we do something there. So my understanding is the key part of a chef's knife is the heel right here. And you don't want that heel to be in front of where it is you grip it, because you want to be able to have it as like a hard stop. So we need to somehow get this, which is obviously, there's not a lot of heel to it. We need to pull it out and pull it back down. So we're gonna use the corner of the dies on the power hammer to drag that down and out, get it to this shape before we continue forging out the blade in length, and then finally move on to forging the bevels. And this is one of those moments where it is all about the preform. I've said it before and I'll say it again. It's all in the preform, baby. The better and the neater I have it at this stage, the better and the neater it'll be when we're done forging and the easier it'll be to then grind it in to the level of accuracy that we want. So I'm gonna put this back in the fire. We're gonna pull down that heel and start drawing out that blade some more.
profile is in. The top here, where that bulges out, that'll get ground out. Excluding that, we're at about two and three sixteenths of an inch wide. This heel here could have done with being drawn out even further. Preform, baby. All about that preform. Learning lesson. I need to drag it out way more than I possibly think. I had trouble with too aggressively putting a bow in it before forging the bevel. We were able to fix it and the shape is there. It is right smack on nine, nine and a quarter inches long. Still plenty chunky, which is nice. It means we have lots of opportunity to work with it and make sure everything is just straight and neat and nice. First though, the last forging process is forging down our integral tang. So we're gonna put it in the fire this way for a little more heating and a little more beating. Okay, we got it brought down a good ways. You'll notice I'm just pecking at it. I want to be really careful. This power hammer doesn't have a lot of control. What it does have is I, or at least I've got used to just firing off single blows. So I can fire off some single blows to help draw this out. I want to make sure this stays centered to our bolster area, because so far we've done a pretty good job of keeping our blade relatively centered to the bolster. So that tang for sure needs to be. We're gonna start bringing that down just a little ways more. What I'm now gonna do is I'm just gonna pop this up here. And we wanna peck at it just the once. Or maybe just once, we'll see. I just wanna make a flat spot, something we can reference off of. Okay, here we go, that's interesting. See that tang is twisted from the bolster area. Let's give that a fix, so we'll lock it up. See if we can tweak that as it needs be. Okay, by the way, these vice grips, <laughs> I know it's probably a little bit of sacrilege, but boy, these were useful to hold on to that. I'm gonna lower the temperature of the forge. Don't need the hammer on anymore. All hand hammer work, all the lightest, lightest tweaks. I sent a photo of the knife to Mareko, who's kindly given me some critique and feedback on what I can do to tweak this blade profile to make it look better. We also need to verify that the blade is straight. So I'm gonna tweak the blade profile, straighten it all out, and then soon we are gonna be on to our heat treatment process. So I'm gonna take some of the belly out here. Take a little more of the fat off of here. Just keep tweaking. The cleaner I make it now, the easier it is later. This tang needs to come over a little bit. It's just a little off center. So I'm gonna lock it in the vise. I'm gonna come in here with a fuller and try and ba boom, boom. Give it a little tweak to make it a little more in the center. Much more central, I like that. You know, when the whole mission is I wanna make something better than I made last year, but already, as forged, it's better than my completely ground finished, heat treated and hand sanded one from last year in terms of straightness. Oh boy, how did I let that through the cracks? Well hey, it's what it's all about. Spotting where you did terribly at something and then hoping to improve. I'm giving her a go. No matter how uh, embarrassing it is to admit just how terrible your work was. Still is in many respects. A couple more tweaks and we should be done. And ready to move on to the next step. Now what you saw earlier wasn't the full extent of the call I had with Mareka. He didn't just tell me how many cubic inches we needed. He also told me how he heat treats his fantastic freaking world class chef's knives. And so here is some of that. After I'm done forging, uh, the first thing I do is actually thermal cycle the blade. On my third cycle, I quench it, and then I actually put it back in the forge to do just kind of a snap spheroidized anneal or a subcritical anneal, which is only bringing it up to about 1200, 1250. But I essentially want tempered martensite, over tempered martensite, that then after I do my profiling, and primary grinding to grind it down to closer dimension to the finished dimension. Then I'm only quenching once and I've been getting great results. So what it is that I need to do is I need to let this cool down and we are going to do two normalizing cycles before I heat it up, quench it, and then straight out of the quench, 
we let it heat up to a lower temperature. That 1200 degrees Fahrenheit he talked about, at that temperature, we'll turn the forge off. I'm gonna let it slowly cool down and do what's called a sub critical anneal. I have never done anything like this, but Mariko speaks wonders of this process. And so that's what we're gonna do. Here we go for normalizing cycle number one. You see the forge is turned far down lower than normal. We have a reducing flame, which burns at a much cooler temperature, and we have a significantly smaller amount of pressure through the propane lines. This means that the temperature of the forge right now is about 850 degrees Celsius. And so we're gonna give it one full normalizing cycle. That's a little too hot. There we go, we're gonna give it one full normalizing cycle, which means cooling it down all the way to air temperature. And it is cool, so in the fire we go. Here we are for round two of the normalizing. That there's normalizing cycle number two done. Now back in the fire for the kind of quench, the not really quench, the kind of quench. And in for the kind of quench it is. Sure would be a shame if it cracked. Okay, let's see if it's straight. Oh wow, didn't move a bit, perfect. It's straight, the kind of quench was a success. And now we're gonna do our post-critical anneal. So I'm gonna turn off the forge burners. And we're gonna let some of the heat from the forge cool down. Right now it's probably 700 degrees or so in there still. And for the post-critical anneal, we want that 1250 Fahrenheit. I should stick to one or the other. We want that 650 degrees Celsius. So we're gonna let some of the heat dissipate, then shove that back in. Should be good to go. And so in we go. I'm hot and sweaty, that is doing its subcritical anneal. And I am very pleased that Doll Shave Club is sponsoring today's video because I now get to go home and I get to use their lavender body wash and clean off all this beautiful dirt. I mean, it's the dirt's lovely, but you don't want to keep it on there. And so I like, I like getting it off. And the best thing is, is Mmm, it just smell like a wonderful lavender flower afterwards. As I said at the beginning of the video, Dollar Shave Club is sponsoring this episode. And so you too can smell like fine lavender like I do each day. You too can experience their shave butter to make shaving effortless with their premium executive razor as well as all the blades that you're gonna need for the month. You also get one wipe Charlie's. Well, therefore, I don't know, cleaning down your mill, something like that. That whole kit is available for only five bucks from dollarshaveclub.com forward slash forge, which is the subscription-based grooming product company, which means that you just take all the hassle out of ever needing to think about where you're gonna get your toothpaste. That's right, they now do toothpaste. You don't have to worry about buying overpriced razors and razor blades. You don't have to worry about stocking up on any of this stuff, because Dollar Shave Club will do it for you, and you can experience it right now. Dollar Shave Club has got you covered from cheek to cheek. Thank you, Dollar Shave Club, for sponsoring the video and keeping all of you guys freshly shaved with your steely smooth shave. <laughs> is that too bad? And keeping you guys freshly shaved with that steel smooth look. I am gonna see you on the very next episode. Thank you. Bye-bye.